Okay, uh, this is fantastic, I think, today that we have the second in a row, uh, getting to hear from f our own folks about what they are passionate about, what they're thinking about, and what they care about. And this, for me, is one of the central values um, of, this, um, um, of this colloquium. Uh, Melissa Masmanian is an associate professor here. Uh, she did a PhD in organization studies from the um, um, MIT Sloan School of Management and a master's in information economics, um, management and policy from the University of Michigan School of Information, Gary and Judy's alma mater. Was Judy was my professor, yeah. Her interests revolve around communication practices in personal and organiza organizational contexts, specifically in relation to social norms and the nature of personal and professional time in the digital age. And we've had lots of great discussions about time. Uh, she's currently writing uh, a book about uh, on her ethnographies of personal time, looking at the role of communication tech in how families juggle busy lives and negotiate work and uh, personal demands, something we're all aware of, I think, as an issue. Um, she's talked a lot about the role of technology in changing norms and practices within organizations, uh, her paper, The Autonomy Paradox, um, won the Best Information Systems publication by the Association for Information Systems in 2013, mm -hmm. and a recent paper, The Work of Reuse, Birth Certificate Data and Healthcare Accountability, uh, won the Lee Dirks Award for the best paper at the I conference in 2016. Uh, she's, received, she's received several awards, but let me just... Um, um, pull out one which I think is relevant to our graduate student community. Uh, she won, um, was it last year I think, the Dean's Award uh, for, the, for graduate student <coughs> mentoring. She is a fantastic mentor uh, as well as a teacher. Um, and so, Melissa, you have a longer title than I'm going to read out. It's one of the longest titles I've seen. It's a horrible <laughs> title. Guys just never have a title like this. <laughs> All right. But we're okay. much looking forward to hearing from Thank you. you Jeff. <laughs> right, um, thank you, Jeff. They did ask me for the title in like August. And I don't know about you, but I had no idea in August what I was going to talk about. I had no idea like two days ago what I was going to talk about. So this title was one of these attempts to, to kind of capture what I thought I might eventually, you know, hone in on. Um, and it, you know, it does. It's just a little wordy. But I am going to tell you about the, uh, so you know me, many of you know me as I am the Vice Chair for Graduate Affairs and the Decade Mentor, so you know me in all these official capacities, but I do do research. <laughs> <laughs> I am an academic and I'm here because I really love what I research. So I'm going to tell you about this book that is in the middle of being written and I'm going to tell you about the data and what it is and what we're kind of honing in on as our core argument. The book is supposed to be a hybrid of an academic book and a popular press book. Our editor says it's supposed to be the kind of book that smart people want to read on vacation. <laughs> when I'm on vacation, I read <coughs> crap. So I don't know who this person is that's going to read my book on vacation. But um, so yeah, it's a different style for me. It's a different kind of scope, a different sort of storytelling. So it's been really interesting. We're about, oh, I'm going to just say we're three quarters of the way writing it. Is this January. the title of the book? No. <laughs> no, the title we're honing on is called, um, we believe it's called Pull to Pieces. The um, invisible, I should know it. The uh, collective, <laughs> invisible collective scaffolds that support our dreams of working, living, living and parenting in the digital age. So we'll get into what that means. No, it's not, it's not as bad. You'll see. But we'll get there. You're gonna, I'm hell, titles are my, my, not my strong suit as an academic, so please feel free to go into titles. But before we get into titles, I want to tell you guys a story. I took this picture, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nancy Huron. Okay? So Nancy uh, woke up, wakes up at 5.30 a.m., and she takes a shower. After weeks of attempting to wake up at 4.30 a.m. to walk on her treadmill in her garage every morning, she's finally given up, and she's letting herself sleep until 5.30. Wrapped in a thick bathrobe, she gently shakes her sleeping six-year-old daughter, Melody, and her eight-year-old son, Dylan, murmuring, okay, guys, it's time to get up. Uh, you, gotta, you get to go see all your friends at school today. She's trying to spin this, right? <laughs> <laughs> While drying her shoulder-length hair, she wanders back into each of their rooms, repeating various encouragements with increasing firmness. Come on, it's time to get up, guys. Time to do it. You can do it. I know you can. Your clean clothes are folded outside your door. I put them out there last night. Go, go on, pick up something to wear. 
And the kids slowly emerge and get dressed. Dylan wanders into her bathroom as she's drying her, wear, her hair, smiling. I'm ready, Mom. I even have my socks on. They make their way downstairs by 6.17 a.m. Nancy sets breakfast on the table. It's kick cereal, gummy vitamins, and a banana. She reminds them to stay focused. Okay, guys. It's 6.26, she repeats, okay, no playing with your napkins, eat your food, no, no, no paper airplanes, come on. <laughs> and somehow in the next 20 minutes, she goes upstairs, gets herself dressed, reminds each kid to brush their teeth, brush their hair, put on their shoes, oh, no teeth, sorry, that happened at night, and make sure they have their backpacks, sweatshirts, and homeworks ready to go out the door. Nancy's daily outfit is slacks, pumps, and a sweater set. She shops once a year at the Ann Taylor outlet and buys everything she possibly can. Uh, she says she goes to town. <coughs> at 6.38 a.m., she grabs the snacks from the counter that were packed the night before because if she, she says, um, I have to push through and pack them the night before, even if I'm tired, because otherwise it just, just won't get done. They're all out the door by 6.46 a.m. And all the school doesn't start until nine in her district, she drops her kids off at early care as soon as they're open at seven. It's just one of those things that breaks your heart, she says. Nancy then goes to Starbucks and she, uh, to get her Starbucks, Starbucks is a noun, which I think is really funny, um, a skinny vanilla latte before hitting the road. So it's busy Starbucks. So today, oh, and today she's driving 60 minutes to the corporate headquarters. She's a regional director of sales at a hotel management firm. She splits her time between the corporate headquarters and, each, and then goes to each of her properties. So she's in charge of a number of hotels. They're called properties. And the short, closest one is about 45 minutes to her house. So in line for coffee, she's inching forward at Starbucks and she answers emails about finding a lost contract, accepting various meeting requests, et cetera, et cetera. Her head down, she inches forward in line and she says, you know, her smartphone is key. I have all these people that need something but they're all things that I don't need my computer to do. Stuff I can get off my plate, so while I'm sitting down to work, I can actually work. Otherwise, I think I'd be up till 2 a.m. every night just answering emails. A typical day will find Nancy sending around 100 emails. And in route to the office, every moment there's a red light is an opportunity to get ahead. So she said, I just, I wouldn't be able to do it, this job if I didn't text and drive. She again serves the her corporate headquarters and she goes to a meeting with two vice presidents and another regional directors of sales. They're talking about kind of corporate <coughs> policy. The first order of the business is the start time of property <coughs> level morning meetings. So these are required meetings where the sales and revenue management teams come together each morning and discuss that property at the start of each day. They are required and they are a signature standard of the company. Now Nancy's boss, the vice president, raises a concern that employees have been coming into work late and not hitting their numbers at a few of the newer properties. So he's suggesting changing the mandatory meeting time might help that problem and get people on site earlier. So as a suggestion, he, move, he suggests they move the mandatory meeting time from 8.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. to force people on site. Now Nancy, who's both you know, a serious and impassioned woman, she just can't help herself. She speaks up. No, it's too early, guys. As a single mom, I get it. It's just hard for people to get there that early. You know, we as a company preach a balance of work and family. How are we going to actually live by that? There's a pause in the room, and they decide to not move the morning back, the morning meeting back. They keep it at 8.30. Of course, later that month, they decide to move the morning back for the new properties to 8 a.m. Okay, so this is Nancy Huron. There she is. She's in, in bed and they're reading to her two kids at night. So my question for you guys is after hearing that story, which by the way is entirely true, every <coughs> line of it, um, true in that I observed all of the things I wrote there. I did go to her house at 5.30 in the morning and uh, you know. What's going on here? Really, what's going on with Nancy's life? Do you want to be Nancy? No. Why not? Too much to juggle. Too much to manage. A lot. Do you think Nancy's unusual? No. Absolutely not. Nancy is a single mom. Um, it's not unusual. She makes pretty good money. She lives in a safe environment in suburban uh, San Diego County. She thinks she's got a really good life, and she does. But it's a lot, right? 
and she's really not unusual. So my question for you and I want to think about with you guys and more broadly is, is this life sustainable? Nancy's been doing it for a long time. I was with Nancy off and on for three years. I haven't talked to her in a while because there's a point where you have to walk away and write a book. Um, I will get back in touch with her when I have the book to share with her. Um, it didn't change in those three years. Actually, every single time I met with Nancy, she said, okay, no, this, this month is the most stressful I've ever been. For three years. No, no, it's, it's going to get better, but this month is the worst. I just get over this hump, okay? I'll tell you more what that means. But in Nancy's mind, this life is not just sustainable, it is her life. And again, she is not at all unusual. So is Nancy's life going to change? How? Her kids will grow up. Her kids will grow up. She does get married eventually. She reconnects with an old high school sweetheart, actually. A really lovely love story. She gets a promotion. Yeah, and she works harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not not what you should do when you get a promotion. It, but you, <laughs> but uh, so, so I'll tell you a little bit about who Nancy is and how she relates to other people we study. But no, people who have promotions do not work less. Just, yeah. Maybe in academia? <laughs> I don't even believe that. <laughs> okay, so what's the role of technology in Nancy's life, guys? She can work all the time, remotely, outside of her She can. Yeah. She has that privilege. And she does. How else does I, how information communicate? So there, there's a lot in the story you didn't get, which I should, this question is not really fair because it's just one little story about Nancy's life. She carries two phones. So she has one phone that's her everybody phone that's supposed to be her work phone, but really it's for everybody other than her boyfriend who becomes her fiance who actually lives at a distance. So she has a special phone for him. She didn't mean to. They got a phone because it was a deal and she thought she'd put all of her personal contacts on it. She never got around to it because, you know, who has time for that? So she really has one phone that represents him and one phone that's for the rest of her life. That phone she carries with her everywhere. She takes it to bed, she has it with her on the dinner table. She shares it with her children, if he texts, she shows them. The work phone has a very different relationship. Nancy's very conscientious about not trying to, use, to look at that phone when her kids see her. So she will actually check that phone when she goes to the bathroom. She'll check it when she's sneaking away to do laundry, but she will not check that phone at the dinner table and she will not check it in front of her kids. So she doesn't think that if she ever lost her work phone that the kids would even notice. <coughs> but that doesn't mean it doesn't affect her experience of her every day. The other thing is that Nancy's a single mom, so she's relying on babysitters, she's relying on before, so, you know, early care and after care of school, and she relies a lot on a very close neighbor. And she's texting with those people all the time, okay? So her phone is not only this conduit to work, but it's a conduit to all the other aspects of her life that help her life go. Her life wouldn't, she could, this is not a human being who could work without having a whole network of care for her children. And we're gonna talk a lot more about what that means. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what we did. Um, <coughs> so a, a colleague and I, I'm writing this book with a colleague who's a, um, Christine Beckman was at University of Maryland now, but she was at Irvine. And Ellie Harmon was a, a graduate student here, and she did a bit, helped us a lot with this, the actual research and data gathering. I wrote her dissertation using some of this data. And we spent a long time with people. So we went into a hotel management firm that we got access to, and we interviewed a bunch of people. Now, they thought we were studying kind of use of technology in the workplace. We did study that, that's fine. As Paul likes to tell me, it was the longest courtship known to man, because I act, or to woman, because I, um, all the time we had in our head that we were going to ask these people to go home with them, because my goal in this study was to really understand something called work-life balance, which I think is an is interesting metaphor, we'll just put it that way, and, um, but no one's really studied that from the life side. So management people, I do have a relationship with the business school, as you heard, so my primary appointment is here, but management of people are really interested in the idea of work-life balance, but you know what, they <coughs> study work. They don't study the other side of that in any comprehensive way. So our goal was to study the life side, whatever that meant, really means just life outside of the workplace, but of course people are working a lot outside of the workplace, so it's very complicated you know, delineations. 
So what we did is after we finished the study, and we said, okay, bye company, we're done, thank you so much for your access, and you know, we exited the company. We then, and they knew we were doing this, by the way, we're not underhanded. We emailed a bunch of people in the company and said, hey, now that you know us, and we're not quite so scary, and we, we likely have interviewed your spouse. We did a bunch of spouses, oh, I don't have that here. We interviewed a bunch of spouses as well. Would you consider um, letting us hang out with you <coughs> outside of work? People surprisingly said yes, almost all of them that we asked. The criteria for being asked was that you had children under the age of 18. We thought that that would help people be more articulate about the potential work-life struggles they were having. We did not think about the fact that it also meant we were going to end up studying parenting. <laughs> you know, you don't always think these things through. But of course, when you spend 60 to 80 hours with a family, you get a lot more than their experience of work. So we really did end up having a lot of insight and access to their hopes, their dreams, their fears, as workers, as parents, and as people, which we're going to get into, which I'll get into. So we spent, when I say observe, just for those of you who don't do this kind of research, I did not sit in the corner of the kitchen and take notes. Right? Observe means I was there. Right? Uh, and so was Christine, and so was Ellie. And what we told people was you can kind of think of us Hopefully, eventually, like a family member, in the sense that we are not family, but in the sense that you don't have to entertain us, but you also don't have to ignore us, right? So, and that's part of the reason that you do so many visits. Um, we did at least 14 visits with all of them, because, you know, the first week is weird. You know, they're trying to figure you out, and you're trying to figure them out. And so, and, and but we're also people. And you know what? I'm sure we didn't have a full transparency into their life. That would be, a, you know, a silly idea. But we sure got a lot of, life just happens, right? So we got all of the details of their everyday life that they, you know, that you can't put a gloss over how many emails you get a day and so forth and so on. And people became more and more comfortable. So we ended up becoming quite intimate with these people. Um, a lot of what I know about them, I'm not gonna share, right? I'm not gonna share with you guys, I'm not gonna <coughs> share with the book because there is a level where when you're doing that sort of intimate research with people, you have to figure out what your lines are in terms of what's appropriate. But I know a lot about them and their families and I think we got, in the end, quite an interesting, you know, insight into who they are and their daily pressures. Um, so we, we, went, we went places with them. We went to church, we went to amusement parks, we went shopping, I planned baby showers, we cooked dinner, we did dishes, we read kids to bed, you know, you braided hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can talk about the kind of experience and ethics of ethnography later if anyone's interesting. I don't think it was uh, not meaningful that we were three women in their homes. Uh, sure, you know, it, we, we, we was, it was not unusual for me to be in bed with a teenager girl braiding her hair. Not under the covers, but you know, like just hanging out. <laughs> and I don't think that other people would have that same access into their lives. So that's something to think about in terms of ethnographic research more generally. But we'll get there. You know, we can talk about that another time. Okay, so this is what we did. Nancy was one of our people. And what we thought about over the years of trying to understand these data is, that story about Nancy, which I read to you, was trying to be pretty typify, will be very grounded in her day, but also typify an experience that we saw over and over again. And one that feels a little bit crazy, right? And I want to theoretically and kind of conceptually understand what's, what's, why is this crazy? Given that it is both very normal and very much the standard of operation for many professionals in the context of Southern California. Uh, as a background, these people were all kind of solidly middle class, except for one family which was solidly upper class, but they were mostly not having, they were not uh, food insecure or worrying about, you know, the everyday um, issues of living and the kind of basics, but they were not wealthy, okay? So they're somewhere in that middle, which is hopefully still the norm. <laughs> um, okay, and they all worked for this hotel management firm in some capacity. They were all salaried employees. Um, but they were in some capacity of a sales representative, um, you know, HR person, something like that, uh, making between eighty and one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Seventy-six. Okay. So, why do you think Nancy's crazy? Or what? No, Nancy's not crazy. Why do you think it feels crazy for us, for me? I don't know about you guys. For me to read Nancy's story. What I've come to terms with the fact that I think one of the interesting things about Nancy and all of the people that I looked at, and all of many of the people I know, 
is that we are all, all of us, we all are all living within a cultural context, no doubt. And that cultural context valorizes certain figures, right? And many of us are trying to live up to those valorizations. So the question becomes, what are those figures? What does it look like in everyday life to attempt to be one of these figures? What are these valorized kind of figures? What are they expected to do? What are the actions that make up the behaviors that make up trying to be one of these figures? And is it possible to be any one of these figures, no less multiple ones? Now Nancy, along with most other people we, we, we studied, is really trying to be three different myths that I think are really pervasive in current Euro-Western society in her class, her socioeconomic class. And one is, she's really trying to be an ideal worker. So ideal worker is a term that was articulated in 1987 um, by Danielle Acker, I believe. Dark Acker is her last name, I forget her first name. But this idea that, no, that's not, sorry, Acker is a different term. She does, she's coined invisible work. This is by somebody else. And I'm blanking out her name. But the ideal worker, and there's been a lot of academic work on this, is the idea that to work in many jobs, more than you might think, not just the elite jobs, and not just the kind of professional jobs, but more and more jobs are taking on this shared expectation that to be good at your work means just the basic being good, so not even great, means that you have to display qualities of an ideal worker. And this means that you are willing to work from home, you are willing to maintain accessibility 24-7, you are willing to exhibit vast amounts of FaceTime that may be at the office and that may be kind of online FaceTime, actually, in the sense that you're available for instant messaging or you're, on, you know, so you're, you're there. And you are willing in all kinds of both little and big ways to prioritize work. Does this ring true to people? Has anyone been in a job where this is expected? Does anybody reason think that they, they've left, they, the reason they've come back to school is because they don't want this job? <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, this image here I love because it's from Teresa. Teresa is another one of the people we studied and she just posted this on Facebook because um, she thought it was funny. And it is kind of funny. So I just grabbed it because I said, oh Teresa, you're funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think this really typifies what it means to be an ideal worker, okay? And embedded in these expectations are a lot of ideas about how technology should and could be deployed in service of this role, which I'll get into. But that's not it for Nancy. What else is she trying to be? Good mom. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so those of you who came to Constance's talk last week, she referenced the idea of the kind of cult of intensive parenting. One of the things that we're trying to really tease apart here is that, yeah, you're a parent. So that means you don't harm your children. You feed them, you know, like, they're basics of parenting, which are not part of this perfect intensive parenting myth. So this perfect intensive <coughs> parenting myth is really what has been pervaded our culture is how a good parent parents in today's day and age. This changes. It's really separate from putting food on the table and making sure your kids are clean and some of these basics. It really goes beyond that of what do we think of. When I think about these myths, I think about when Nancy lays down at night, what does she feel guilty about? Does she feel guilty that I starved my children? No, she didn't starve her children. She feels guilty that maybe they didn't engage in enough togetherness time. You know, she dropped them off at, at 7 a.m. Maybe she feels guilty that she's one of these <coughs> parents that cannot actually do all the school expects in terms of monitoring their homework every night, signing the sheet that she monitored their homework every night. See, you're laughing. It's not that everyone does. That, they, that, she, you know, that she is being held accountable by the school to volunteer. She can't volunteer. This woman cannot volunteer. And she feels guilty about it. She's feeling guilty that she, you know, she actually couldn't go to the 2 p.m. performance of her daughter's little gymnastics camp in the summer. She can't. 
right? So she's not able to show up and, and maintain all of the expectations. So navigating homework, I maybe should be a broader term, but it's all of these expectations that the school is putting on her. Her kids are allowed to be in one activity each. Her daughter takes gymnastics. She's incredibly good at gymnastics. She's a little gymnastics pro, and she, Nancy, will not allow her to be on the competitive gymnastics team. Why not? Time, travel, money, all of it. And her daughter's like, but mom, and she's like, I know. <laughs> You're really good, okay? So part, and, and she's only in one activity. Her son is in uh, karate. Many of the families who studied, families that had more <coughs> temporal resources and people on the ground deployed, had their kids in four, five, six activities. So I mean, I can tell you about Rebecca, who is a stay-at-home mom. She's got, you think she's temporarily rich, she has a lot of financial resources. She has four young children under the age of eight. And I think she's juggling like 13 activities. And all, you know, it's, it's so, and then she's, she's very calm, right? So how does that happen? That happens with a lot of people helping you do that because every one of those activities requires a pickup and a drop off, as well as uh, cleaning the sports clothes the night before and packing the sports, sports bags the morning up. It's just, it's very labor intensive. But we believe that good parents are cultivating their children and setting them up for success in life based on this kind of wide range of enrichment activities that are part of expectations of parenting. And monitoring media. So this goes a lot of what Constance was talking about last year. Parents have a lot of fear. A lot of fear that they don't know what to do with. They don't know how much is too much. They're not listening to the American Pediatrics Association, you're right, Constance, but they don't know that we have a pervading nar uh, nar negative, negative narrative that screen time is really evil. What do you do with that when you have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old and you gotta get some laundry done, okay? Um, and so the fear of what is too much. So, that, so you're, the, the myth is someone is a parent who highly monitors media, that is hard to live up to, okay. There's one more in here that's slightly hidden because it's oftentimes the least prioritized myth, but it's still there. And it's still something Nancy feels guilty about every day. What's the last figure? Taking care the of yourself. Ultimate self. Thank you. This woman gave up waking up at 4.30 a.m. to get on her treadmill. Can you believe that? What's wrong with her? Sorry. I have a treadmill in my garage. <coughs> I don't get up at 4.30 a.m. <laughs> but yeah, she feels guilty, right? She feels like uh, the one thing I am not doing in all of this is taking care of myself, but it's a very particular kind of taking care of yourself. We're thinking of it as virtuous me time, right? So we have multiple, multiple people who do exercise. Exercise is healthy. I'm not against exercise. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that they call this exercise my time. That's my me time. I got that little me time today. I went to the gym. Great. But other forms of me time are not valued, right? So if you, it's so interesting to see how people explain the fact that they really wanted a glass of wine and to, to watch The Bachelor. Like this is, this is pretty common, by the way, from what I can tell. I watched more Bachelor during this study, and that's a side note. But, um, uh, but the idea that I might want to drink some wine and watch The Bachelor is something that I feel pretty, I don't feel virtuous. I feel like, Gosh darn it, <laughs> I deserve to watch The Bachelor. Um, so th 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 there is forms of me time that are more or less virtuous if we're thinking along these kind of mythological ideas of the good person and the good self. So the ultimate self is someone who attends to the body as a vessel. You care about what you eat. Um, you know, you get up every morning and make green juice from organic vegetables. Or if you're a Chad mayor, you have your wife do that for you. Um, you prioritize exercise. Um, and you engage in these kind of um, virtuous me time activities. Okay. It's impossible, people. I think I've made that pretty clear, right? Engaging in any one of these, kind of engaging in the activities in service of promoting oneself in any one of these figures is truly impossible. Nobody can be the ideal worker. I mean, we. Do you realize what's not in any of those bullet points I talked about? Tell me. It's a pretty big one. Sleep. <clears throat> Thank you. Who said that? Yeah. Is, ver is sleep virtuous me time? <laughs> yeah. 
No, <laughs> it is not from, a, from this kind of cultural discourse perspective. Sleep is for the weak. We have more popular articles about there about the sleepless elite. So if you only need four hours of sleep a night, you are gonna rock it. Now, of course, in the extra time you have during the day, you should exercise, right? But so we do valorize exercise in a way that we do not valorize sleep. And one could say from a health perspective, they're probably both important. But yet one of them is given this kind of status of virtuosity and one is not, right? So yeah, sleep. Everyone's ex every, everyone. Everyone I study is exhausted. You can say that unqualified. Even the people that have the most resources financially and temporally that you would think they're exhausted. And we'll get into that. OK, so they're impossible. I love this ad. This is a little bit old. You can tell by the device. But isn't it great? So this woman's um, Blackberry was the smartphone that allows her to do it all so she can too. Look at her. She's such a good mom. And she's clearly like such a good worker. Because uh, what else would she be doing on her phone? The library. Um, she looks pretty fit. You know, and she's glowing. Her skin's glowing. So she's taking care of herself. So this is what we're being sold. <coughs> this is a real explicit way, but it's in all kinds of little ways. <coughs> Anyone who is of this culture, meaning that they've grown up in Southern California in this socioeconomic stratum, is aware of this. I, can, I think I can pretty unqualified say that they are aware of these myths. They may not be as trying to enact them as much as Nancy is, but they have to live in terms of them. We all have to live in terms of them when we're of this place in time, historically. So what does it really feel like, right? Is technology making it be easier to do all this stuff? Why not? Because like, really, why not? Yeah. It creates the potential for us to do more. So then, because you have a phone that lets you do all these things, you have to do all these things even more. But why? Why do you have to do it? Why, why? Why do you feel like you have to do more? Because if you could never switch off, then you're always accessible, and that goes into the being a perfect worker and things like that. But technology gives you the ability to do so much more, so you have to do that much more. Yeah. So you pick up on two things there. Oh, just, just so you don't think I'm gender biased. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of going on what you just said there, Reinforce, but um, the technology here is figuring in in a very explicit way of what it is to be these people these mythological figures that I'm trying to argue are impossible, but yet people still have internalized and are attempting to enact in all kinds of little ways. And the technology has a twofold, or maybe tenfold, but at least twofold effect here. One of which is it makes me feel like I can do more. One of the things that I have not pulled out from these myths is they're incredibly individualistic. I am the perfect parent. I am the ideal worker. And I take care of myself. Now in practice, am I working alone in a bubble? Absolutely not. Parenting's all the more hilarious. Am I parenting in a bubble? There are people that I'm parenting, right? Um, but we have this very individualistic, and even exercise. I usually, I'm, that's the one that is the most individualistic experience of all of these, but it's still very social in terms of the ways in which we exercise collectively, that we rely on others to give us time to go exercise. Et cetera, et cetera, especially when we're trying to cobble together these lives that you're trying to enact these multiple roles at once. So technology is always, this kind of technology, information communication technologies, I don't like these broad sweeps of technology, but these mobile information communication technologies are always a bridge between an individual and one or if not several collectives, right? So why do I feel the need to do more? Maybe it's a little bit because I've internalized the myth that I should want to be someone who does it all. Um, that autonomy paradox paper that, that Jeff brought up, I really tried to dig into the fact that I talked to all of these professionals who all told me they were type A and that they wanted to work the way they did. And that the, you know, I'm like, okay. So I really tried to dig into what is the collective dynamic of a bunch of people who think that they're making individual choices. But, so it could be that I've internalized this myth. It also could be that there are a lot of people expecting me to do the idea that an ideal worker works from home and maintains accessibility is 100% facilitated by the capacities of these information communication technologies. We can create expectations because of the capacity. Now, we don't have to. 
I have another paper that actually talks about a group of salespeople that did not create expectations of increased accessibility when they were given Blackberries, but they are very much not the norm. So, you know, an individual, there's a collective assumption that everyone has this kind of capacity now. And the individual on their own maybe says, this is really cool, I get to use the device to monitor and communicate. We're talking about like way back when Blackberries first started or something like this, not before the expectations have emerged. But then the group says, oh, okay, you know what, everyone's monitoring. Everyone knows what's going on in this digital world. I'm still in the world of thinking, hey, I'm awesome. This is going to enhance my ability to do more, enhance my autonomy, enhance my sense that I can do it all. Oh, wait, uh-oh. We all walk around feeling like everybody's monitoring, and they're all feeling like they're choosing to do more. All of a sudden, we've got collective shifts and assumptions of what is of how accessible people are, and then should be, right? So no longer are you a good worker if you get your work done, you're now a good worker if you respond to email at 11 p.m. And a good parent, okay? This is not just in the working world. It's very easy to think of it just in the working world. We've got just-in-time parenting. We've got kids who assume their parents are ready. We've got teachers who assume that they can send out emails and change the homework at 9 p.m. We've got all kinds, so this is not just in the world. Work, it's, it's very palpable in the world of work, but it's very much, beyond the world of work, these expectations. Okay, so then you've got intensify the pattern of use because oh my gosh, everybody thinks I'd be available. Then you've got a shared sense that competency in whatever role you're doing equals availability and responsiveness. Increased stress, increased lack of downtime. No longer are you this autonomous individual who feels like they can do more. Then you've got a big, basically reconfiguration of the role. So the myth has changed. What it means to be an ideal worker and to be a perfect parent is different in this world, okay? And people that internalize that. So I see this happening in all these various ways. Now the, the, the individual one is a little bit more tricky. I don't really have time to get deeply into it, but it still has components of this, especially if you think about the quantified self and how much we become accountable to our bodies in new ways. So that's a slightly different story, but it's still, has some of the, the, you know, the major kind of same configurations as this one. Okay, I'm not done, people. <laughs> Is Nancy's everyday life just parenting, working, and not exercising? There were, some, there were some little bits in that story I read to you that probably didn't hit home to you, but sure hit home to me. There's one line in there. I might have even mumbled over it, so it's okay if you didn't get it. She said, your clean laundry is folded and waiting for you outside your room. They're her children at 5.30 in the morning. Who did that laundry? She did. Yeah. So life is not just being these <laughs> rules. <laughs> life is a lot more. And there has been a long history of work, about, well, not long, 30 or so years, critical feminist studies, on the role of domestic, the, the labor that goes on in the domestic sphere, and how this labor is very invisible. It's not, it's, you know, it's, a, it's feminized. It's not always women doing it, but it's a feminized role. It is undervalued, underacknowledged, and oftentimes just not seen. Nancy sees it. Who do you think is folding laundry at midnight so that she can wake up at 5.30 and her kids have clean clothes? Now Nancy is a single mom, she has someone come in and clean her house. Um, she has her neighbor who did, by the way, go to their gymnastics recital for her. The neighbor's a stay-at-home mom and her best friend. But we'll get into that. Okay, so I only have 20 more minutes. I'm gonna go, I'm trying to tell you this whole story with enough depth that you can stay with me but, but not go over time. Okay, so there's doing work. There's folding the laundry. There's going shopping. There's making sure there's food on the table. There's cleaning, right? You, Nancy may, doesn't have to be doing all of this doing work, but somebody has to do it, right? In every family, okay? Some of this is paid for. Some of this she's doing. And if she had a partner, that partner would hopefully be doing some good too. There's mental work. What does I mean by mental work? How many of you are the person in your household Whatever household it is that knows when you're out of toilet paper. I love my husband, he doesn't know. He will be like, um, yeah, when I leave town, he inevitably like ends up out of, it's, it's like, it's like become a joke. Um, I hope he never sees this talk. Uh, the mental work is the person who knows we're out of toilet paper. 
The person who knows what we need on the shopping list. The person who knows that our kids need a dentist appointment. They may not take the kid to the dentist appointment, but they say, okay, the dentist appointment is next Thursday. Can you do that? Okay? That's a whole other kind of work, and it's a lot of work. A lot of work. And this is the <coughs> kind of second level of invisible work that's become more and more visible academically as we've begun to talk about the second level of invisible work um, more, much more recently. So it was usually that the women were doing the cooking and cleaning. Now it's like, well, okay, so uh, dynamics have changed in families, family structures have changed, more and more people are in the workforce regardless of gender. Who is doing this? Well, you know what, it's mostly still the woman, but not always. Um, so there's mental work. And now here's the question I've been trying to get at and where we really want this book to go, which is, does Nancy feel alone in the world to you? She's actually not. Everybody that we study, to some degree or another, <coughs> are relying on other people to help them. You could be paying for that help. That doesn't mean you don't have relationships with the people you pay with. You, you pay. <laughs> you could be relying on your neighbor, who, by the way, is also your best friend and doing it out of love. Um, you could be relying on your grandmother, your mother. We have um, three families of the nine had heavy grandparent, no, four, four of the nine had heavy grandparent involvement. Um, this is kind of a, a, we think of this as a structure of care from a different age, but a, and I don't know how prevalent it is, we're looking for that data, but actually grandparents are playing a big role, at least in this, these people's lives. Um, there's different types of people that are healthy. This is, you know, we don't, this is another level of the invisibility of work that people do both to just get through the day, right? Like Nancy can't even go to work, no less be an ideal worker if she didn't have after school care because our social systems do not, actually our school days are not aligned with her, you know, the most basic work requirements for FaceTime. So if you're Nancy, if you're anyone who doesn't have a stay at home parent, um, you're work relying on some form of child care, absolutely. This is a social, this is a, this is a social problem, I think. Um, should we shorten the work day or lengthen the school day? I don't know. Okay. Um, what we're trying to tease apart, which we find really interesting, are what are these kinds of scaffolds? Who are these people? What kinds of work are they doing? So if we go back to this, which of these types of work can people offload or not offload? in service of both just getting through the day and enacting these myths. Now, of course, the more that you buy into the myth and really try and be these kind of ultimate roles I've been describing, the more you need people on the back end. You know, one of my favorite people in studies is, is a man named Chad. Chad is awesome. Everybody likes Chad. You guys would like Chad. Like, he's super nice, he's super personable, he has a really good relationship with his two daughters. Um, he's a vice president, they, have, they make good money, they travel the world. Chad is great. And Chad, I think, I'm going to assume this, goes to bed feeling pretty darn good about himself. Now, you know, he doesn't sleep enough, and sometimes when he doesn't, you know, when, sometimes when he gets a little stressed, he has stomach problems. He does, you know, check his smartphone on the toilet in the morning, but he exercises every day with a private trainer. His wife does make him green juice every morning and she packs his lunch, and she makes a homemade meal from scratch every night. And his daughters are in swimming and cello, and what else, art, and, well, there's more. What else are his daughters in? Music? Cello. Okay. Um, swimming, art, fashion, oh, and yoga, and they do yoga. Um, no, I'm not kidding, you think I'm making this up, I'm not kidding. Chad goes to swim meets, he goes to cello recitals, Chad is, is a good dad. He's home in time for bedtime. Okay, how is Chad, Chad? He has way more than a wife. He has Olivia, okay? But Olivia, by the way, also has a job, and she feels very strongly about trying to maintain her professional identity. She's, she's, she's established in her own business and she works very hard. Olivia has Tina, who comes in three days a week to help chop vegetables and do laundry. I have no idea how bad I want Tina. <laughs> um, she's good friends with Tina. She, Tina leaves every night with the home cooked meal that they cook together for her family. She also pays Tina. She also has Martha, who comes in once a week to do a deep clean. 
She also has a personal trainer, but she can't go do it near as often as Chad because she doesn't have time. And um, she has her parents who live about two blocks away and really help get those kids to all those activities. So Chad can be Chad because he is Olivia. And Olivia can be Olivia because she has an army. <laughs> and Olivia, by the way, is really stressed out. <laughs> you would think if you would, to see Olivia on paper, you'd be like, this woman has it all. In some sort of kind of glorified way. Olivia is probably the most exhausted and stressed person I've, I've met. More than Nancy. Okay, because Olivia is staying up till 2 in the end every night because she doesn't actually have time to do the work that matters to her, to her so much because she really ha wants a professional identity. Okay, so we think about there's layered scaffolds. Now, some layered scaffolds are, are the parents actually, it's not like Chad has Olivia who has an army, but the parents together have an army. So we see different spousal relationships and how they manage this army and who's doing the mental, you know, the, the work. Then you've got the solo scaffold, which is in a way what Olivia is serving to Chad, but some people, like um, Brenda, just has her husband and he's doing all that work. Um, and so really, if you think, you know, they are still within the family in a more traditional division of labor, but he is really acting as a scaffold so that Brenda can go, you know, kick it at, at, at work. And she's doing amazing and she's been promoted three times, Jeff, and she's working harder than ever. <laughs> um, but Brenda can be Brenda because she has Corey. So, but he's acting as a solo scaffold. So we're trying to unpack these different models of scaffolding. What do they do? Who's doing this work? Who does it serve? In what ways? How does it figure in to our internalizations and our desires to be these ultimate figures? And guess what? Scaffolding is its own kind of work. Right? So <clears throat> they are doing work. They may be doing the doing work. <laughs> they may be picking kids up from school and shopping and cleaning, et cetera. But in order to maintain and build these scaffolds is really hard. So there was another woman, Rebecca, with four young kids. I told you I talked about her, four young kids under the age of eight, all these activities. She's just moved. She left a place where her family had in-laws, siblings, and friends and babysitters that they trusted. <coughs> she is alone in Southern California with none of that. And she went from having a layered scaffold to now being the, the solo scaffold. So she's really feeling the loss and she is trying so hard to find people to help her because she's interviewing babysitters and she doesn't like them. Okay, um, she's going, she actually tried eight churches and she couldn't find what she liked. She tried Bible study and the women told her that she wasn't a good mom. Anyway, um, that was just that one Bible study, but so, Invisible scaffolding, maintaining scaffolds, first they're hard to build. But once you have them, they require their own work to coordinate and be nice to. It really matters. So I don't want to think of scaffolding as only a transactional thing. Yes, Nancy's neighbor is a core scaffold for her, but this is a, this is a true relationship for both of them. So there's different level of emotional valence in these different scaffolding relationships. But I would, you know, and, and the kind of emotional valence versus paid work is very interesting to unpack. Um, but, it, but across that spectrum, there is emotional work involved in being nice, in appreciating people, in valuing their contribution. And just, you know, if you come home at the end of the day, you want to be like, hi, babysitter, hi, spouse. <laughs> you know, you're, thanks so much for watching my crazy kids. Okay. Um, so there's this whole nother level of emotional and um, coordination work that we're calling scaffolding work because scaffoldings are both incredibly valuable. They're what people use. They transactionally use them to get through the day as well as enact these myths of perfection. And they're their own kind of work, which is another form of invisible work. Okay, so let's go back to technology in our last 10 minutes because that's what I promised I would talk about. Um, so before, we were talking about the role of technology in the enactment of these myths, right? So that there is this collective maybe in the workplace and there's a collective in the parenting sphere and, it's some, and the, in the, inten the technology intensifying what it is to be this kind of figure. So our shared expectations of what it is to be an ideal worker, our perfect parent, ultimate self have shifted and technology has been part of that shift, enabling that. But technology has also become a way in which we manage and deal with scaffolds. So it's playing a very different role here. Same device, right? So it's not that it's the same device. So Nancy may be checking her email in one second and texting her babysitter the next second, but it's actually a very different um, 
that the technology is serving a different purpose and it's being kind of employed and motivated and de deployed in a different way, okay? So the role of technology in this what we're calling invisible scaffolding work or scaffolding work is coordination. The idea that you can do just-in-time work. The idea that no longer in the workplace do you say, what are you going to have done by five? But you say, oh, I'll pop you that spreadsheet when I'm done with it. Assuming that you will be there then pick up the spreadsheet and do the next thing with it. It's really, you know, so there's a lot of just-in-timeness that's been talked about a lot in our culture at writ large. The idea that the, the teacher can email at the last minute that you can text the coach and say you're gonna be late for soccer, that you can text your spouse and say, oh hey, I can't pick up the kids today, can you, can you pick that up, can you, can you do that for me? A lot of just-in-time-ness, as well as, hey, you wanna go for a run tomorrow? Or, hey, you know, last minute, I'm able to get out of the house to do this, can we do exercise? Or, I'm, I'll tell you guys the truth. I canceled my personal trainer. I have a personal trainer. She comes to me once a week. See, I'm those people too. I have to think about that in my study. But I canceled it this morning at like 10 minutes before because I couldn't deal. So, um, you know, this is the kind of just in timeness. That sounds so fancy to have a personal trainer. It's really not that fancy. It's, and it's much less expensive than having going to a gym. See, I feel some guilt here. Um, but that's okay. It's my virtuous me time. Uh, but so this just in timeness is a big part of how not only are we changing the expectations of what it is to be these roles, but how we manage these roles in service of the everyday experience of just doing life. So who are these scaffolds and how do we draw upon them? And how are they you know, collectively engaged in service of, of what seem like of individual accomplishments? Mm -hmm. And then we then need to think one step further about what is the role of value in these different accomplishments and who is getting value and what kind of work. The other thing about technology is it becomes a way to appreciate. I don't think it's the best way, but I do think that you see a lot of emotional work going on through texting. Mm -hmm. The thank you, you're awesome, you know. And this is happening, so this is another level of emotional work that's happening in service of maintaining and, and kind of employing these scaffolds. So what I want to get to in the last five minutes is this idea that technology again has more, it's at least a twofold, probably a tenfold role in the dynamic I'm trying to describe here. But if you think about it, these are the, spir these are the spirals within these different myths that are being intensified through the ways in which people are choosing collectively and individually to engage with technology in service of making these myths more intense. But it's also the arrows, right? And there's this interesting, we have to kind of get at the kind of dyn dynamicism here. Is that a word? Yeah, dynamism. Dynamism. That these things are intensifying. So to do the basics of what it is to be an ideal worker or a perfect parent is becoming intense, intensified. <clears throat> Point one. Point two, the more I buy into the ultimate, the perfect, and the ideal, more I buy into the kind of mythological and impossibility of fully enacting any one of these myths, the more I need this stuff, right? And then the more I'm doing this work, and everyone's doing this work. So who are these people? What is this work? And what is going on here is what we're trying to really tease out. And so this is what we're talking about, the idea that someone like Nancy might seem a little crazy is because she's doing all of this every single day, right? She's bought in to some degree, even if she's failing in her mind, she's bought in. She's deploying, she has to. Now, it may be a cheap shot to use a single mom as an example, I just liked her story, but I'm seeing this in all kinds of family structures. The stay-at-home parents, stay-at-home parents might be really spending a lot of time here. But you know what, they feel the lack of not having this. The full-time default primary workers are spending a lot of time here. But they might be feeling pretty bad about this. You know, so part of these myths are things that we've internalized is who we should be able to be. And the technology that allows us to, to you know, think that we should be able to be more. 
And so thinking, really teasing out what it's doing within and in between is what we're trying to get at. So that's where we're trying to get. It's a lot of different threads. Um, and like Constance, you know, these kind of book projects are much bigger than anything I've ever done. It's really fun. And I'm trying to tease together and, and tell a story that's both interesting and will resonate with people who are living these lives. It's not a self-help book. I don't think I have clear answers. But maybe we can give some language that will help people understand why they might feel a little bit crazy. Um, and then do with that what they will. But we'll also be different, you know, helpful for academics who are trying to understand the roles of technology in everyday life, as well as some of the politics of invisible labor, domestic labor, and the kind of different forms of labor that go into creating the idea that we have these ultimate individuals, which we clearly don't. So I want to thank my um, co-author and researcher in arms, Christine Beckman, um, and Ellie Harmon, who again did some of the wonderful research on this. And then we've got lots of people who've been giving us feedback, <coughs> and of course, including our participants. So we will. I'm surprised that one fact you didn't mention in here was partners. I mean, that's, got, that's a kind of a combination of self and parent and so on, but it's also kind of unique in a sense. Oh, yeah, so we didn't talk about partner relationships. We've talked a lot about why we're not talking about partner relationships. <laughs> Part of it is um, that's the one thing they don't show us. The one thing they keep secret in, in ethnographic work. So I mean, I have a sense of who's happily partnered and who's less happily partnered. I have some <laughs> sense there might be some things undesirable. I mean, like you know, the alliances. But this is not. But but they don't talk about this. Um, and um, the other, more substantive in a way, not more substantive, but that's a practical reason. The more substantive reason is I think that it, it's actually um, often devalued the most. So that we just, we, I'm trying to do all this. <laughs> you know, uh, Olivia and Chad, the one I told you about, who I think are, are doing fine as a couple, their big fight over is whether or not, why she can't come watch TV with him in bed at night. And she's like, so, yeah. What are your concerns with how your sample represents like the social spectrum? Well, I mean, I don't say concerns are the right word because it is what it is. Mm. So it's more about just being transparent about that. I think that the idea that these people are living in terms of these myths is not unique to them at all. I think that there are, uh, it's a broad phenomenon that people in this kind of socioeconomic sphere and space and time across Western culture are living in terms of these myths. So that doesn't bug me. I do think that you, there's so much popular press about different aspects of this. People aren't bringing it together in the way that we are, but I feel like it's a pretty prevailing phenomenon. In terms of who they are, there's nine families. So we can tell you who they are, and you can take from that what you will. I mean, ethnographic research is never about generalization, but it's more about thinking about these families in terms of each other I, and what we can learn from yeah, them. Yeah, I, I guess I was also trying to think about, like, well, what about the stories that are not being told as opposed to the stories that are being told, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I can only tell the stories I can tell. Ooh, yeah. um, I, and, I, and I say, there's some things that I can't see doing this kind of research. But there's a lot I can, and that other forms of research aren't going to allow people to see. So I just need to kind of capitalize on that. But I think we want to own what we can't see, and we're not going to try and shy away from that in the, in the writing. Yeah. So you have these people who are maintaining these roles by scaffolding through other people who are also using scaffolds to maintain their roles. And does the buck stop somewhere, or is it just this <laughs> recursive, like? Yeah, I mean, the buck stops the lower socioeconomic spectrums of society. OK. You and know, who's, is, does Tina have a scaffold, the one who comes in and, and chops vegetables? She might. She's got someone watch her kids while she's chopping vegetables. Um, so I guess, but we, we unfortunately, I think that's something that we we want. We're going to talk about, mm -hmm. but we don't have the data beyond this first level. Okay. But yeah, so I do think that's like, something that's going on here. When, because like the second part of that question is like, does the buck stop at somebody who has less roles to juggle, or does it stop at somebody who has a complementary? A scaffold, you know, because we, you and I might have different needs, and maybe I can meet your needs and you can meet mine. I think it's both. I think that's probably a very good way to think about it. So I have one family, Dave and Lisa, who truly act as scaffolds for each for each other in ways that we didn't see in other families. Um, so yeah, I do think there's different different models that's worth thinking about. I had two questions, but we just did one of them, so oh, that's. Yeah. But fortunately, I had my, my backup. So I, I mentioned the, the, the word. <laughs> 
aspirational that you used at the beginning, and um, I mean, which obviously sort of like you know speaks to this sort of question of this sort of mythology. But I am intrigued as to how it is that people see themselves as being on a path towards something, and That's what a great it is. Question. What it is that they anticipate. The kind of um, proximate, the Nancy saying, this is the most stressed out I'm ever going to be, but it's going to get better. Yeah, which of course I've never, ever in my life. Yeah, I mean, I do think that the, the proximate, I think what they think they're on a path toward, to be perfectly honest, is balance. Oh, wow. Balance. 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 Yeah. They actually think that they're going to achieve something. I don't think I've really thought of what balance will look like, yeah. but I think that is the goal. It's not success in some ways, it's balance. It's finding a way to manage it all. So it's worth, it's worth teasing part. Maybe. So I was thinking, this is a wonderful presentation, and um, I think that I was wondering if you thought about lies as lies. As a, yeah, lies. Just lying as a way to also maintain all of these relationships. Um, oh, I like because, that. Yeah, because I was thinking like, like anecdotally about my own parents, whose par parenting lives have been before technology got in so deep, and my mom still kind of did all of this work, except she did not have or technology was not such that it spilled out all of this visibility because while you text and while you do these things, it also creates traces that are hard for my dad to ignore. Ah, your visibility. Yes, yes. visibility so, and accountability and lies. And okay, not I'm like not lying, more about that. but more like performing. Or, or vi what, is, what is made visible to others. Yeah, or, or that even extending a little bit of what you do just like performing, you know, saying I will be there. You don't have to be there. A lot of this ideal worker behavior is just the I'm I am there when you need me language. I mean, it's like that. Hey, I'm here. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting to think about. Okay. Yeah, I'm feeling like well, I want to make sense of people's time. So we'll do that, and Gary, and then we'll go let you guys drink. I'll go downstairs to talk. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. I think it's been kind of a thread in a lot of what you're talking about, even in the language, like saying like they feel like they're crazy, and then you know, there's like this undercurrent of like mental health. Oh, illness. that's a really good question. Like, how does that play into yeah. the ideal myths and everything? I mean, I think in society, mental health and mental illness are something that maybe, I don't know if I would go so far as maybe a product of this, but it's clearly something that's highly stigmatized. Um, what, I, what, what I did not talk about in this presentation is less their mental health and more their physical health. Many of them have had physical, like um, Nancy had breast cancer. Um, part of the reason she feels so guilty about not exercising is she feels like that she should. She's not alone. For a very, very small end, we had a lot of health problems. Two cancer, three cancer scares, um, chronic migraines, chronic back problems, et cetera. The mental health is less visible to me as this researcher because, again, this may be something that, I mean, I feel like I got pretty close with many of them that I probably would have learned. We have two children with special needs in this study. That becomes a big part of what it is to be a parent. Um, so there's a lot of nuance that I clearly am not getting at here. We're trying to figure out how much that nuance to put in the book. But I do think the mental health is a really good question. I don't mean to say they're crazy. I'm sorry if I use that word in the wrong way. And I don't actually think they think their lives are crazy. I'm thinking I'm feeling, as someone who's watching this, and a pervasive feeling that there's something maybe a little bit insane going on in the way that people are living their lives. But again, not in the mental health kind of way, in the more colloquial use of that language. So maybe I need to think about more artful language to describe that. One of the questions you asked us a little early on was whether this was sustainable. Do you have a sense from these people whether they think it's sustainable? They think it's just life. They, they, they think, think they're going to find balance. Yeah. They think that uh, they will find balance next week. Well, next <laughs> month. Okay. All right. Well, let's find some balance and some <laughs> time. Thank you, guys.